Hello and welcome live from Dresden to the High Vault Web Talk with our legendary Q&A sessions. We didn't have a Q&A sessions until now, but I think at the end of each year we will have one together, of course, with Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn, the Director of Business Development here at High Vault. Uwe, a question and answer session in fully 80 to 90 minutes. What can we expect from today's Web Talk? Most probably that we are not be able to answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I have already seen that we have more than 25 questions already wow. in the slider chat. And uh, nevertheless, we are still open also to take additional questions. Some of the questions we have already prepared a little bit so that we can go through the main topics here. Mm -hmm. And we are again in a location live here at three o'clock in Dresden. Just very shortly, where are we? Yeah, it's hall, hall four. So as you can see now, we have on our right side uh, a cable test truck. And uh, what we can see there is uh, something what we have already uh, introduced to, to you. And what you can see in the back of my my side here, uh, it's a uh, power metering system, uh, f especially also for testing of power transformers. Nevertheless, I think we should not spend so much Absolute. time on the environment here. We should really concentrate on the questions and therefore we should nevertheless uh, have also the introduction of Slido. Exactly. I expect to yeah. see a slide. Yeah, that's exactly what we expected to have then the access code for Slido. It's hashtag web talk and directly on uh, www.sli.do. Wonderful. The yeah. And with this, of course, you can connect to us uh, as all the time. We are taking more and more questions. But first of all, I want to introduce you to our excellent set of experts. We start with Professor Kavi Neesh. Uh, he is a professor at the Department of Electrical Power Engineering from the University in Norway, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And in the last 20 years, he had held different academic and industrial positions, including principal professor with the University of Tehran. He was at the ABB in Switzerland and Germany at Areva, TND. He managed, um, he, he uh, guaranteed, he graduated in electrical engineering from the University of Tehran. He received his PhD from RWTH Aachen. So Professor Niersch is with us today, belongs to the research group for high world technology. His research interests are mainly in the board field of high voltage and switch gear technology, especially on current interruption and in power switching devices in AC and DC power network, new materials for high voltage insulation and for high current interruption, breakdown and aging behavior of insulation materials exposed to high volt DC and repetitive fast impulses. Diagnostic and condition assessment of power switch gear as well as high voltage and high current tests and measurements. Professor Kavi Niesh, thank you very much that you are with us here. Tell us about your research topics. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and warm greetings to Dresden to the team, to the support team. So I'm Kavi Niesh, as mentioned, so I am a professor at NTNU. And in the next few minutes, I would like to have a short presentation of the high voltage technology at NTNU. So if we start with the uh, first slide, so this is, there are some figures, key figures from NTNU. So you see that NTNU is the largest university in Norway. Mm -hmm. So by the way, in the picture, you will also see the main building of NTNU with Northern Lights. So this is the peculiarity of Trondheim. So having this only here and some other cities. So in the Northern part of our planet. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, uh, university has 55 departments, a uh, total budget of almost 1 billion euros per year, mm -hmm. and in close collaboration with many industrial partners and institutions, especially with the SINTEF, so which is an R&D institution. So I'm belonging to the Department of Electric Power Engineering. This is one of these 55 departments at NTNU, mm -hmm. and at um, the Department of <clears throat> Electric power engineering, we have five research groups which 
uh, are many different uh, fields of electric power engineering, and one of them is related to high voltage technology, where I belong to. So in the department, we have almost 100 employees, and in the group or research group of high voltage technology, we have four faculty members, three professors, one associate professor with many PhDs and postdocs. Now I wanted to give you short information about my research interests. So if you can go to the next slide. So yeah, you see that uh, there are a few pictures here. So I'm working mainly on switch gear. So current interruption both from the experimental and simulation uh, view of uh, view. And then I have also worked on condition assessment of different high voltage apparatus and had and have some projects related to partial discharge measurements on their pulse conditions. So you see the two pictures, these are related to our high current lab. This is also one of the unique labs at the university because we have the possibility to connect to the grid. So we can create short circuit currents up to 140 kiloamps. And we have also the possibility to have very large currents of up to 1,250 amps at medium voltage levels, 24 kV. So this makes it very interesting for load break uh, current investigation. So you can directly test load break switches, for example. If you uh, look at the, uh, the, the picture on the bottom right, so this is also schematics related to one of my PhD students related to a synthetic making circuit where the making behavior of load break switches is analyzed and she performs many uh, optical investigations, many advanced diagnostics there. And we have one more picture there. So these are only exemplary pictures I have taken. This is related to this partial discharge measurements or detection under pulse conditions. So you see that we uh, use uh, not only the <coughs> electrical rays, but also this PNP, so the photomultiplier tube. So probably we have also some opportunity to talk about these things afterwards. So I think this is uh, the right time that I uh, pass the word on to my other colleagues and to you. Thank you, Professor Kavis Niesh, and thank you for the wonderful picture with the northern lightning above you. <laughs> we are coming to the next expert, uh, and we are looking forward to Yuri Serchuk. Uh, he received his MC and his PhD degrees in electrophysics and high voltage engineering from the National Tech University of Ukraine, uh, Kiev Polytech Institute in 86 and 95, respectively. From 86, he worked at the Institute of Electrodynamics at the National Academy of science at the Ukraine and in 96 uh, 97 he was a visiting researcher at the high voltage laboratory at ABB high voltage technology in Zurich Erlikon in Switzerland of course Uwe knows this also very well in 99 he joined Kalmus University of Technology Technology in Gothenburg in Sweden where he worked on various positions. Since 2017, so since four years, Yuri Serchuk is a professor in high voltage engineering and he is the head of the unit Power Grids and Components at Kalmas University. His research interests include electric charge transport, associate process in dielectric materials and on and on and on. And of course, uh, we are very uh, happy to have you with us. To um, Mr. Serchuk, can you give us also um, some topic of your research. Thank you very much for, for the nice introduction. And I also want to join Professor Nesh uh, by sending greetings uh, to the south from the north. Uh, so you have Scandinavian greetings, uh, let's say. Yes, uh, I may uh, say a few words about uh, our university if we can look on the yes, slides. The slide comes in right now. Yes, uh, thank you. So, uh, to be very short, uh, Chalmers University of Technology is the second university, uh, second largest university in, in um, Sweden after the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. So, we are situated, we situate, uh, on the west coast in the city of Gothenburg, uh, and we are doing research and education in technology and natural science. Also, 
uh, offering uh, education, engineering, natural sciences, shipping and architecture. So today we have uh, approximately 10,000 students and uh, 3,400 employees. So very soon we will, uh, in, in eight years or something, we will celebrate 200 uh, anniversary of the establishment of the, of the university. So you are very welcome to join us for this. Uh, concerning the, the high voltage research, if you can look on the uh, next slide, mm -hmm. uh, I will be very short again because it's impossible to tell everything. So of course. Uh, we, are, we are very much focusing in high voltage engineering research. We are focusing on the materials. So we do a lot of testing and characterization of materials for different components, high voltage components, and we have quite unique, I would say, uh, instrumentation for, for doing very sensitive measurements. Uh, like, for example, we, we can measure currents down to, to phantom peers to, to, to define the um, DC conductivities of materials, electric conductivities. We do advanced uh, the electric response with the homemade uh, home developed uh, techniques uh, for this. Uh, we do a lot of partial discharge measurements at conventional and power electronic induced uh, stresses, different voltage shapes. Uh, also a lot of uh, surface potential measurements, uh, which is about interfaces in the uh, insulation systems. Mm -hmm. Studies of material degradation include accelerated aging tests uh, for nonlinear conditions, elevated temperatures, and also high frequencies. We are, we are capable to, to run the tests uh, up to 50 kilohertz, for example, with uh, modern amplifiers. Uh, we do a lot of electrical water treating and also uh, detection of stochastic PDs in the electrical motor installation. Yeah, another part uh, which is uh, uh, say, my speciality more or less, uh, uh, it's uh, computer simulations. So uh, if you look on the next slide, mm -hmm. it just brings ideas what, uh, what areas we are working with. So we actually doing a lot of magnetostatics, electrostatics, heat transfer, and multi-physics simulations for, for very different objects, starting from uh, on the left picture, for example, um, it's electrostatic environment during lifeline walk uh, on the lines, and we look on the performance of the tools for that, for example, and going down to micro scale levels where we can look uh, on the material performance for, for different applications. And here comes this charge transport in, in, in different type of materials, uh, which is about conduction phenomena, HVDC performance of, of, of different materials and components and so on. Uh, surface charging and charge decay on interfaces in the components of uh, insulation systems, that's another subject. Uh, and electrical treating and partial discharges in solid materials. So these are kind of, this is the range of simulations we are uh, doing in our group. Mm -hmm. So I can perhaps uh, pass uh, what to, to my colleagues here. Thank you very much, Yuri Serchuk. Nice to have you with us in the team of our experts, of course, and you will, of course, answer all the questions later on. We have number three in our lineup uh, of experts. It's Professor Kai Rethmeier. Welcome to Professor Kai Rethmeier. He studied high voltage engineering at Berlin Technical University, where he also obtained his doctorate in the field of partial discharge measurements. And he gained professional experience at the IPH High Voltage Test Center. Center Berlin. He worked at Bauer, PMT and Omicron, uh, both located in Austria. Omicron, um, he performed uh, PD measurements all over the world and he was a trainer for the MPD measuring system since 2012, so nearly 10 years. He is a professor for high voltage engineering at EMC at the Kiel University of Applied Science. And for more than 10 years now, he has been conducting the seminar Partial Discharges for the German VDE, the VDE. And his statement for today and for the discussion is only no PD is good PD, he says, and as long as there are any kind of pulses above the ambient noise level, this leads to endless discussions with the customer. Welcome, Professor Kai Rethmeier. 
Thanks a lot for the Hi, introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Just give us a little overview of your research topics. Of course. Um, I'm located at Kiel, at the northern part of Germany, and maybe you can start some of my slides. Yes, there it is, Kiel University. And maybe if you don't know Kiel, you know this famous sailing boat there. It's the Gorch Fock, uh, where we spent 135 million <laughs> euros to yes. repair it. Uh, you can get a lot of high-voltage uh, resonant test sets for this, really I think so. Um, <laughs> so, um, our University of Applied Sciences is about 50 years old now, which is uh, more or less the maximum age you can reach in Germany because 50 years ago we started to found such kind of universities where we have very close contact to uh, the industry, to our technical partners. Um, we have approximately 8,000 students here. Um, you can study electrical engineering, high voltage engineering, power engineering, so everything uh, related to the topics we want to talk about today. And uh, when we go over to the next slide, and I only prepared two slides because I, somebody told me that was a limit, so I got this wrong, sorry. Um, from Kilo Coulomb to Pico Coulomb. So um, I'm just sitting here in my uh, high current lab where we do uh, destructive current testing um, normally on blades of uh, wind turbines or uh, wings of, of Airbus, Boeing, whatever, um, which is... Um, connected to some lightning phenomena. Um, impulses up to 400 kiloamp, which is quite a lot. Um, so we can see the discharge of their high voltage flashovers uh, where we can detect um, where are the weak points of such constructions. And uh, of course, from the kilo coulombs, we can go to the pico coulombs or even to the femto coulombs. On the left-hand side, exactly there, you can see an electrical tree, uh, which you don't like to have in your solid insulation, insulation systems. And we can do a lot of sensitive measurements here in the lab. And um, I'm a specialist for doing such measurements also on-site, under noisy conditions, on transformers, on cables. And that's what I really like to um, be challenged by environmental conditions, um, which are not often that nice to perform sensitive measurements. Great. Thank you very much, um, Karl, Kai Rietmeier. Uh, we, of course, come into discussion with you, but uh, we uh, just present you our expert, Dr. Ralf Peach. He was already two times here live at the High Vault web talk. Uh, web talk. Dr. Peach studied physics and received his PhD in electrical engineering at the RWTH Aachen, focusing on aging of cables. And afterwards, he joined ABB Corporate Research in Switzerland to work here on PD phenomena and the insulation and interruption behavior of gases. He took over the AHV lab of ABB in Zurich, focusing on the development of GIS. And in 2001, he joined Highvolt and worked in various technical positions here in the house. In addition, since 1996, he is an active member of the SIGRE study committee, SCD1, and in various working groups as a specialist, secretary, or counterer. Since 2016, in September 2016, he's the chairman of the Sigre Study Committee, SCD1, and um, he has been lecturing on diagnostic and high voltage measurement technology at the Chemnitz University of Technology, and his focus there is on partial discharges, of course, and on various measurements and diagnostic technologies. He is also the main lecturer at the High Academy seminars of High Volt. Hello, Dr. Ralf Peach. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for <laughs> that. Nice introduction. I like to add nothing else because um, we should keep the time for answering the questions because the other one, the new guests here in our round, they had the chance to introduce themselves and yeah, Absolutely. so I have nothing to add. Thank you, uh, Mr. Peach. And of course, as Uwe Kaltenborn in the beginning said, we prepared some questions already and we start with the first question to Yuri Sergio. Yuri, your first question uh, comes from Indonesia and the question is, sometimes the cross-correlation of physical and chemical properties are not easy to model for dielectric materials. How far can the simulation handle these issues? Uh, well, this is a real issue, I would say, in the simulation because, uh, yeah, you need the input for your models and whatever type of simulation it can be. So, uh, 
you may have a uh, few parameters or you may require uh, quite a number of parameters. For example, uh, if you just want to calculate the capacity field in the in the system, it's just permittivity of the material which you need, right? But if you talk about, for example, transport of charges uh, in the solids and then conduction mechanism, then you may need uh, 20, 25 different parameters uh, to be included in your model. And that's always the problem. Uh, how to find the set of parameters which you need, and uh, also if they are actually realistic and good enough uh, in the accuracy uh, of the measurements uh, which were done to, to extract them from the experimental data. Uh, uh, yes, uh, mm, that's not trivial at all. And even if you have the set of parameters which is needed for your uh, simulations, you may um, arrive to actually quite a uh, tricky situation, uh, and uh, which is related to actually numerical issues, and even get artifacts in your uh, results. Example: An example is, um, again, electric conductivity. This is perhaps the only quantity, physical quantity, which ranges uh, within such a wide range. It can range uh, for 25 maybe orders of magnitude. If you talk about uh, metals, it's about 10 to 8 maybe Siemens per meter. If you talk about best insulators, it can be as low as 10 to power minus 20 Siemens per meter. Uh, there is no numerical method or software uh, which likes such gradients, such contrast. So you have to do something with that. And uh, uh, the, the one of the ways, uh, if you could please show the slide which was prepared for this question. Uh, yes, uh, there are different ways. And one of the ways, for example, uh, to use what is called effective media theory. On the left uh, upper uh, picture, uh, you may see, yes, this one, uh, the basic approach, actually. If you have a block of material which is made on the microscopic level from different components, it can be binary, it can contain three components, four components, it doesn't really matter. So you define the representative volume, and then you can obtain average quantity Overage parameters for, for that volume, whatever it could be. For example, if this is the piece of dielectric, so you may have inclusions with different epsilon dielectric constants and conductivities, and then find the overage uh, for, for the representative volume, and then use this overage for the larger piece of material. So that's how it works. And uh, this normally gives possibility to uh, smooth out the, the, the contrast between the, the, the material properties. And uh, applications to this may be um, any. Uh, here are two examples. Uh, application of the effective media uh, approach for modeling of film capacity. For example, you need to know the uh, temporal, thermal, thermal conditions for the uh, capacitor bank on, on the right-hand side. Yes. Uh, how to obtain it? you have to go really deeper uh, in the structure of each capacitor unit on the left, and even, yeah, this one, which is on the micrometer scale. So then you define the overage for that, identify elementary losses, and then go to the middle scale, calculate for the unit capacitor block, and then uh, obtain the losses for this one, and then you go to the larger scale. So this is called multi-scaling. So normally that's what, how, how we deal with these things. Uh, for transformers, for example, on the right, th this can be even more tricky because you may have uh, uh, separately properties of the windings, including insulation layers. You may have uh, separated regions for the magnetic core, where you all the time need to identify the overage uh, for, for the magnetic permeability in this case, effective losses and so on, and then go to the larger scale to, to, to implement this in the large model. So this is one of the way on handling, uh, handling this, uh, these issues. Um, uh, again, uh, it's hard to, uh, to be really sure 
how, how these properties which you use in, in the simulations uh, reflect the actual situation. So uh, finding realistic parameters, that's uh, still uh, one of the part of the puzzle here. So that's what I wanted to comment about this question. Thank you very much, Yuri Serjuk. We are coming to the next question, which reached us before the talk. Um, and the question is for Ralf Peach. The question comes from the Netherlands. Thank you for the question. How can you simulate failures caused in production processes? Hmm. Um, of course, you can simulate some aspects of uh, production failures like for example um, if you have a spacer of a GS, you can introduce a void or delamination and so on and investigate such defects but um, a single one make maybe some statistics if you analyze spacers how they fail and you cut them and look at them and so on you can do it with cables and so on but um, if the production maybe we will come later to that, um, has been done and the typical tests were done in the factory and on site before delivery and then it's mounted on site, cable or GS again, then you never know what happened. And this failure, of course, you cannot simulate in, in detail because it's, it's too much expensive and you cannot explain everything. And so the question is mostly what kind of diagnostic tool do you have? And already mentioned, partial discharge is one, depending on what kind of access you have. It could be acoustic PD measurement, it could be an optical one, infrared, or even something else. So this depends highly on the high voltage equipment and what kind of diagnostic can be applied. And that's a tricky part. And every different company, ISC and SIGRA and universities like today, have um, focused their diagnostic tools to get some information during such tests. But to predict something is very difficult. Thank you very much, Ralph. Peach, you want to um, just add Maybe, something? Yeah, I would like to jump into that because uh, you can also turn around the question, uh, not uh, asking the question, how can you simulate something, what happens during the production process? Nevertheless, what you can do with the diagnosis that you can relate the diagnosis uh, results then to the production process. For instance, uh, if we could get video number one, uh, there we will see a test system System which is able to do exactly that. Yeah, what oh. we have seen yeah. there is a test system for distribution transformers and they have uh, one requirement to get the high volume throughput then uh, there uh, done in the factory. And the major question is in which way then with this high volume manufacturing you get then also the quality uh, online and uh, with the test results you can then also estimate what will be the deviation uh, during the different uh, production steps there. 
and you can utilize then the test results also to cross-check then deviations also are for the design and you can implement this data then also in your, to your ERP system and can really then also control your manufacturing process. This is maybe a different kind of answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Uwe. And we're continuing with the subject of simulation and it's a question uh, to all of you, but we start with uh, Kave. Uh, can simulation replace real tests to identify maintenance requirements of equipment, for example, transformer or circuit breaker? Uh, yes, so this is a quite complicated question, but I would like to emphasize two different aspects in this regard. So the first aspect is that many, many physical mechanisms are involved in many of these type of failures and tests we do. And therefore, if the question is if we can consider all of these different physical mechanisms together and couple to each other in our simulation. So this is the first question we have to bear in mind. And the second one is that there are many stochastical uh, phenomena involved. For example, if you consider the breakdown or how a, a, a switching arc behaves. So this is not the same every time. So it can be different from time to time. For example, if you have different uh, different surface uh, surface roughnesses on the electrodes. You could get different uh, breakdown voltages in vacuum. And the question is if it's possible to go so deep and to try to analyze everything on micro scale. So most probably the answers or te the theoretical answer would be yes, but it requires enormous computational power which makes it practically not possible. So therefore my idea is that uh, even though we can uh, develop many many useful things using the stimulations but only partly the real physical mechanisms are covered and the tests cannot be easily uh, replaced. So this is my comment. I pass the word to my colleagues and I'm looking forward to their opinion. Thank you. And we go to Professor Kai Redmeier. What's your opinion about it? Can simulation replace real tests? Ah, your microphone is muted, Kai. Yes. <laughs> no. One, two, three. Thank you, That's Tom. No mute symbol here. Excellent. Okay, so my quick answer is no, I'm not that optimistic um, because I'm owner of a test lab, of course, and we do a lot of testing uh, instead of simulations. Um, you already uh, addressed the point. Um, we call it TEAM, T-E-A-M, um, Thermal, Electrical, Ambient and Mechanical Influences, which may lead to breakdown process and therefore it's very complicated to just get uh, to just handle these uh, four things and as you already said maybe there are other uh, things um, that have to be modeled and uh, in my opinion uh, practically uh, definite no to this answer no way to simulate this right. and quickly yuri and uh, ralph would you adjust some uh, point to this some sentence uh, yeah, I, I, I may say maybe uh, to protect a bit, uh, I, I would not be so negative to, to, to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope definitely, that. <laughs> uh, all the statistics factors and and, st on, and the randomness of the of the phenomena actually brings the uncertainties in the simulations. Uh, so my point is like that: that uh, simulations is actually a tool to explore background processes and to identify the, the, the range of parameters uh, within which the component needs to be uh, studied, finally, experimentally. So it, it's just a tool to narrow the range. So it's not useless. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, it has power, but uh, of course, it cannot be replaced in the real life situation, but still useful thing. Mm -hmm. And just a short idea from Ralf Peach about simulation. Then we can close uh, this question from the already, US. Yeah, as already mentioned, you need the boundary conditions as a physicist. If you don't know them, then you cannot simulate. And the more complex it, it makes no sense. 
and you don't know what is really going on in a real system. And that's a tricky part. Of course, if you make a type test, then you make normally simulations and then you make type testing. And if you have a difference, then you look at reality and not at the simulation, and then you improve the model. It's vice versa. That means you still need the physical object. That means the test, or the test device. All so right, it's thank an ambivalent mm -hmm. Thank situation. you very much. And in this question and answer session that we have here at the end of our High Vault web talk, we have three parts. Uh, we are a good half an hour on the run already, Uwe, um, and we jump to the next topic, and the new topic is now gases, insulation, and circuit breakers. You have a question. Yeah, so this is a topic uh, where I also have a certain uh, share into the discussions there, and it uh, goes in the direction of our the insulating gases. So we have there a discussion on SF60, so for hexafluoride as an uh, interruption media as well as an insulation, insulation media uh, widely used in the past. Now we have the situation that we have three different kind of ecological alternatives in the market. And uh, there we have technical air, we have a mixture of uh, different uh, carrier gases with fluoronitriles and fluorocatones. And uh, my question is, any idea what will be the winning technology? Yeah, Kavi, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kavi, you, you should yeah. be the, the first to go with the question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Uwe, for the introduction. Yes, as you mentioned, there are plenty of investigations on the alternatives for SF6, and we know all that there are many uh, adverse or bad environmental impacts from SF6 because of this very high GWP. And you mentioned three different uh, solutions. So one of the solutions is to go for natural gases, for example, like compressed air or CO2 or something like this for installation and to use vacuum interrupters for the switching. The other ones would be that you want to use uh, the alternative gas bulbs for interruption and um, uh, in installation. So, for example, you can use fluoronitriles or fluoroketones, as uh, many major manufacturers did. I prepared one slide here. So this is a very uh, dynamic situation. Also in this slide, I wanted only to show how dynamic it is. So in the beginning of this year, so we have heard that EU Commission report was published. And in that report, we have seen that fluoronitrile-based uh, mixtures have been recommended as one of the solutions. And the action uh, we have uh, observed just after a few months after this uh, report that was the Hitachi ABD power grids at that time now Hitachi Energy went towards the uh, GE solution so to implement this fluoronitrile. So that was one of the acts. But recently, just a few days ago, that was also another very interesting move or act, and that was a joint uh, statement of nine different manufacturers, so very large manufact Japanese manufacturers like Mitsubishi, Toshiba, and also energy, uh, Siemens Energy, Siemens, Numentura, Schneider, so many of them. And they write one sentence in their joint uh, uh, statement, and the sentence says, each of the undersigned is committed to delivering TND equipment free of fluorinated gas, so that means SF6, and PFAS gas, so that means also, uh, if you want to translate this to normal sentences, so they want to more or less go in the direction of using natural gases, CO2 or pressurized air. So you see that there are many different solutions, and to the question if there would be a, win a winning solution or if would be only one solution, I would say, uh, we can only speculate, by, but my opinion would be that in the next few years, you will see that there are many parallel solutions. So in the second solution there, the natural gases are used for the installation, as I told you, vacuum interrupter technology is used for the switching. And this brings us also to the question, if it's possible to use high voltage vacuum interrupters, because we know all that in the medium voltage vacuum structures are dominating switching technology. 
and probably this will also be addressed in the course of uh, the questions we get. Already, I take the next question uh, already, but uh, I think yeah. we can have also some additional input, especially uh, from, uh, from C. Gray. Uh, Ralph, uh, what is the actual status in the discussion within C. Gray? They are really discussing it um, in different working groups, and some are already published about the replacement of SS6. And maybe we have to distinguish between the pure dielectric insulation, where no switching and disconnect operations are done. And just 10 minutes ago, or now it's half an hour ago, I was connected to another Seagull symposium. And still, as mentioned by Kavi, that CO2 and O2 is still investigated by different companies so they have, and I ask them and they still focus only on this gas of course it, it's too expensive to spend too much on different gases and one main task which has definitely to be solved is and still this is not really solved is the switching operation which kind of mixture is the best one and survives so many switching operations because sf6 has a big advantage after switching the molecules join together again to sf6 and the other gases are nearly destroyed of course there were investigations how many switching operations and this the definite the complex more complex molecules are still the, the same and keep the dielectric behavior Behavior. And this is still an investigation. Of course, there are some results, but still, this is an open question. So I just join this the answer that this is an open item, and maybe in 10, 15 years we will know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I got a promotion uh, because I took over now the moderation of the next two questions. I agreed with uh, Florian. Yes, because I, it's your field. I mean, yeah. So as Kavi already mentioned, uh, the circuit breaker technology. I think we should stick a little bit on that. So uh, Kavi, you already mentioned vacuum interrupter technology will be key. And if you look into our vacuum inter interrupter technology, it seems to be in the moment that we see there a kind of technical limit at a voltage level of 245 kV. Uh, as we have experienced with the SF6 uh, self-blast breaker, never say never regarding uh, technical limitations. Nevertheless, my question would be, okay, where we are with vacuum breaker uh, technology and uh, do we see there certain limitations and uh, what could be ideas to overcome that? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So the question is if it's possible to use the vacuum circuit uh, breaker technology at higher voltage levels. So the problem is that the insulation in vacuum is not linearly or the voltage breakdown voltage is not linearly increasing if you increase the distance. So you have more or less like a saturation like effect. So I have also tried to visualize this in one of the slides. Uh, so yes, you see it. Here you see on the top left that the vacuum breakdown voltage is not increasing linearly with the gap. That means for lower voltages, for the medium voltage applications where the BIL is almost 200 kilovolt. So in that region, the vacuum interrupter technology would be brilliant, very nice, very compact solutions. But if you want to increase the BIL to double, so we have to over proportionally increase the distance. So that would be one of the solutions. The other solution would be that we want to use it with many, many vacuum interrupters in series. So there are many different solutions. So I uh, took two of the solutions of two of papers. So you see that one of the papers is from 2004. That means from the technical point of view, there is no limitation to have even uh, vacuum interrupters for 750 kilovolts with many, many vacuum interrupters in series. In this case, 645 uh, vacuum interrupters in series. But there is one another problem. The other problem is related to the X-ray emission level. You know that in the vacuum interrupters, we have the electron emission out of the cathode, and the electrons are accelerated towards the anode and heating the anode. So when they are heating the anode and uh, uh, they are stopped, we have a so-called 
Bremsstrahlung. So what does it mean? So this Bremsstrahlung means that some X-ray is generated. And how much X-ray is generated is depending on the energy of the electrons colliding the metal. So that means if you increase the voltage, you will have much higher X-ray levels. So the maximum according to IEC standards or accepted level is five microsievert per hour. Uh, but this has been seen that for 145 kilovolt vacuum bottles, this is not critical. So that means if we want to have only one bottle for 750 kilovolt, if it's possible, so I think from the take, uh, from the economical point of view, it's not possible or it's not cost competitive. But if it's possible, then we have some issues with X-rays. But if you are able to divide this very large voltage to many smaller voltages, which are connected in series, then we will have one solution. Now you see that this solution is much more complicated compared to normal gas circuit breakers. And therefore the question would be if the reliability is as high as in case of uh, gas circuit breakers, because in this case we have many, many different parts. Failure of any of these parts would result in failure of the whole system. So that means the reliability is uh, reduced, in my opinion. And the other problem would be also the cost, because if you are going to have this, it would most probably not be a cost competitive solution for higher voltages. But there are some solutions available on the market and most probably with, uh, with uh, future developments, it could be also possible to develop these things and make this work for higher voltages. So this is my comment now. Yeah, thank you very much. So I, I don't uh, want to enter into the discussion of uh, multi-gap uh, solutions and then uh, the requirement of uh, voltage gradation and uh, creating capacitors. Nevertheless, one question to all of you. I, assuming uh, the uh, uh, gas breakers, uh, the self plus breakers, as well as vacuum breakers on a mature technology so far. And uh, the question is, what about uh, alternatives like power electronic circuit breakers? Uh, we hear from time to time. And I remember also that there was discussions about so-called electrodynamic breakers. So any comments on that side? And we go once around the table. So maybe Yuri. Yeah, I, I would like to comment uh, on uh, uh, yeah power electronic circuit breaker or uh, actually solid state circuit breaker, how they called. Uh, in such systems, we ha normally have uh, um, actually power electronic module and uh, some device which uh, dissipates the energy, right? Uh, so and uh, basically, uh, if it comes to the uh, to the module which uh, really breaks the, the, the current. Uh, here we may arrive to the similar issue which uh, already mentioned by Kave uh, for, for, for the vacuum circuit breakers, right? Because today's modules, uh, semiconducting modules, they are not capable to handle too high voltages, right? We have to connect them in some way, in series or uh, in some more smart uh, way. And that comes to the cost issues, right? So uh, sooner or later, the, the the total cost of the of the such a solid state circuit break uh, will become too high to to be feasible really to to implement it. So uh, with the development of this. Uh, uh, wide band devices like based on silicon carbide and then uh, gallium nitrate. So it's more and more attractive actually uh, because you, you may do, uh, you may implement fast switching and, and this kind of things. And that the development is ongoing quite quickly. So hopefully in the future few years, we may be able to, to have solid state circuit breakers for higher voltages. Kai, <laughs> may I ask you uh, for your opinion? Yes, Uwe. I think with um, the ongoing developments for DC applications, maybe this will get a little kick for the whole mm. thing because um, you have a lot of advantages or on the other side, uh, it's not really easy to uh, 
to uh, extinguish an, an arc without a zero crossing. So uh, power electronics work very well for DC applications and with the ongoing development for DC applications, DC components, DC grids, maybe this will lead to reliable or more reliable cost-effective DC switches or power electronic switch in the future. But I have to agree, uh, this is not tomorrow, but in some years or in a decade or so. That's my opinion. Ralf, you have an experience, a uh, long experience, long-lasting experience on uh, SF6 also as an interruption me medium. Uh, what is your opinion in, a, in one sentence, please? <laughs> I, I can only tell that uh, due to the DC um, distribution and transmission network, definitely like power electronics is now under strong and intensive investigation. Also in secret. Yeah, so definitely DC will make a major uh, impact on that. And uh, as no one so far has taken up the topic of electrodynamic breakers, Kavi, so it's left to you. So what's about no. uh, the, the famous liquid metal uh, interruption technology? Do, can mm. we expect mm. something in the next years or is it, uh, is it uh, still in the lab? Um. So let me first talk about these uh, solid-state switches. So I would like also to emphasize that there is a very important disadvantage when it comes to solid state. And this is related to very high DC patients compared to the mechanical switches. Because you need some on-voltage, and on-voltage times the current flowing through the solid state makes the power loss. So if you compare it with the normal mechanical switches with resistances of few micro ohms to few tens of micro ohms, you will see that the DC patients would be many orders of magnitude higher. And this makes a real problem. So that means, it, uh, to my opinion, it's, uh, it's not probably a good solution that we have purely solid state switches. Most probably we will end up by the so-called hybrid switches where we will have a mechanical switch for the current carrying and the solid state for the current interruption. And in that way, we can also reduce the DC patients. But coming back to the uh, liquid metal breakers, so I think there are some technical problems with this liquid metal, which make uh, them uh, a bit complicated as the product, as an industrial product. So that means, at the moment, we are not on the level that we can say this is a product based on the liquid metal circuit breakers. And this electrodynamic uh, or uh, any other mechanism for opening of the, uh, the mechanical switches uh, will not change the whole context because at the end of the time, we have to have an arc and we have to extinguish the arc. And this is not possible. So, Coming back to the DC applications, so I also agree that in DC applications we have no other chance, so uh, or only uh, arc-based or switching arc-based switches are not going to work because we have no zero crossing, and therefore we have to have some uh, ideas to create other, either to create these zero crossings or to have some other tools to interrupt the current, and therefore the importance of the the uh, solid state switches in the context of hybrid switches will become very much uh, uh, dominant in uh, DC applications and emergent applications. Yes. Hmm. We are thank blasted. You. Thank you very much, Yuri. And we are about halfway through our talk. And uh, of course, we have questions prepared, but we have more questions coming in via Slido. Thanks for your participations. And they all run. I think these laptops are pretty full of questions right now, Uwe. That's correct. So I, I try to filter them and to uh, label them a little bit. So I check if that's working. Yeah, uh, because we have started with the topic on simulation. So I would like to come up with uh, the question on simulation. We have one there. So most accurate models for simulation are also time consuming and need amounts of memory and calculating performance. How to cope with that? I think this is a question uh, going to Yuri as well as Ralf. Yeah, 
uh, fully agree with that uh, statement uh, that, uh, yeah, if you want uh, the, the accuracy, so you have to uh, invest uh, in, your, um, in your hardware. Uh, to be able to handle uh, large-scale problems with good special resolution, which is uh, delivered by the proper meshing of the of your tasks, and uh, yeah, perhaps you need to to use efficient uh, uh, efficient numerical methods as well. Uh, typical example of the uh, of such uh, situation uh, when you have uh, propagating plasma front like in electrical discharges, uh, whatever type it is, uh, spark or maybe uh, yeah, just trimmer discharge. So we are talking about uh, uh, spatial resolution on the level of uh, micrometers to resolve the front uh, and. Uh, the actual length of the of the such discharges may be tens of centimeters. So to create such a mesh, uh, you need uh, really uh, either very powerful workstation or uh, or even cluster. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there are ways uh, to deal with this uh, issues. Uh, uh, for example, we can borrow some methods uh, uh, from fluid dynamics. Uh, to again overage the properties in some way and and, and try to 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 adapt these techniques to uh, specific topics but uh, to be honest uh, I don't see uh, much possibilities to uh, somehow resolve this um, to be able to use just uh, you know laptops uh, to solve really complex uh, situations Thank unfortunately. You. Thank you, Yuri. So I think uh, I know a little bit about the simulation activities t uh, you have done in the past. Uh, not what you're actually doing, but uh, I, I think uh, it, it's always a difference if you do that in an, an uh, academic environment. So, Ralf, uh, what would be your answer uh, from an industry perspective, uh, how to handle uh, these requirements for uh, for the simulation and uh, in which way you can cope with that then also are in a daily engineering environment um, it's a tricky question and normally we do it in such a way that we cannot simulate everything for example um, big test system or test hall and looking for the transients so we look at special components and make backwards calculations that means uh, what is the electric field for example or some other things and maybe then to scale it up but this is a pr typical practical way and the other way is uh, as Yuri mentioned uh, the computation time is a big issue nevertheless how tiny even your model is. It depends on the resolution. And unfortunately, in normal, the models are not working in parallel. And that means you have really, for example, 60,000 small computers, and uh, then you run them. But this is very difficult to write such a program that it really uses this kind of technology. Like for weather forecasting or climate forecast, there this technology is used. But for a company, you cannot afford it. It's not possible. You have to make a compromise between practical life and add on with simulations. Thank you very much. I have found another question which is related to circuit breakers and uh, gas insulated, insulated uh, uh, equipment. So, and that goes in the direction of the circuit breaker and uh, disconnectors, which is what type of on site testing is available for equipment such as circuit breaker or disconnector switches, and how effective is on-site testing for this equipment? So the first question here to me would be, is there any uh, on-site testing uh, useful at all? And maybe uh, Kai uh, has there some experience in, in that direction, and uh, maybe also Kavi can, uh, can give some insights there. Uh, I'm sorry for on-site testing of circuit breaker. Um, I'm the guy uh, who's, who's called for the partial discharge measurement. And uh, if there's a vacuum tube, 
uh, of the circuit breaker, this will be tested in factory. So from my point of view, uh, nothing to add to this topic. Yeah, so that means partial discharge is definitely the, the wrong approach to uh, evaluate a circuit breaker. Uh, yeah, for, so for transformers, power transformers, that's fine. For cable, cable termination, that's fine. But uh, circuit breakers, um, I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do. I know it know about some monitoring and also testing systems uh, to do acoustic measurements on uh, circuit breaker drives. Kavi, do you have any idea uh, about on-site testing of circuit breakers? Yes. yes. Um, uh, so you know that the circuit breaker or switch gear is a very complex equipment, so have many different subsystems and Many of the faults are related to some of the subsystems, not directly related to high voltage. For example, you have the drive mechanism, you have the current carrying part or the path, and you have the interruption. So there are many different functions which have to work at the end of the time. And some of these functions can also be tested or examined during the operation in the network. So for example, it's easily possible to test the driving mechanisms. For example, you can have some travel curve measurements, or you can measure the coil currents, or you can measure the motor currents, or you can try to uh, uh, record the vibration and apply some vibration analysis. So all of these aim at the uh, operating mechanism or drive mechanism. But there are also some more tests which can be done, and these are for the current carrying path. So for example, if you see that a large amount of heat is generated because of a bad connection or because of very large resistance in part of the circuit breaker, this could be also uh, a reason for the failures in the circuit breaker. So for example, infrared so you can thermography can be used to see if there are any hot spots in the circuit breaker or not. So do you see that these are not direct, uh, directly related to the high voltage in that sense, but these are related to the switch gear as the component which has many different functions to do. Thank you very much. And of course, we are still collecting questions, Uwe, as the whole time, because at the end of the session, we also have the possibility to answer some of the questions. We are now a good hour live broadcasting here from Dresden. It is 4 p.m. now in Dresden, so it's in the eastern part of the world much later and in the western part of the world much earlier. Thank you to you all that you join us still now. We change again the topic, Uwe, right. and we pronounced already the partial discharge so this is also one of your topics um, you want to add something already or we have also prepared a little video for the yeah, next so topic it's video number three and uh, I think no words we would like to have the video right now film up data information decision. We talk about partial discharge and our next question goes to Professor Kai Redmeier. Kai, what method is better, do you think, for partial discharge diagnostics, the conventional method or ultra-high frequency? So, um, 
both methods have some advantages and disadvantages, of course. Um, the standard method, IEC 60 to 70, that's a traditional thing to do measurements. Uh, we do this in the lab, uh, in the factory with a more or less screened environment. Uh, but sometimes um, it's so noisy that you have to switch to some uh, detection frequencies, which are, as the name already says, ultra high to um, uh, UHF. Um, and there you can reach a very good sensitivity or directivity to um, distinguish between partial discharge that are very close to the sensor equipment or external noise. And the most uh, advantage for UHF is that you're very sensitive to something which is very close to you. Electromagnetic waves um, origin from partial discharges will be attenuated a lot in the UHF range. And therefore, if you detect something with an UHF antenna, um, you may be very sure that this is more or less coming from partial discharges. But it cannot be calibrated like the standard method. There are other disadvantages, compatibility. Um, uh, you cannot compare it to other measurements. So uh, my uh, recommendation is um, try the standard measurement first, uh, which gives you comparable results, and uh, try UHF if you're not able to measure something because it's too noisy. This question came from uh, Indonesia, uh, Ralf Peach. Uh, what's your answer about it? Are you going uh, with the set just from Kai Redmeyer? Yes, but um, I'd like to add something. Why is there the difference? The difference is that UHF is radiated signal. So you not do not measure the current. That's also the advantage that you can localize. With the conventional measure, uh, measurement, uh, the IC uh, 6270, you measure the current inside the test equipment together with the coupling capacitor. And that that is, therefore, you're not able to recognize where or localize it. And in addition, UHF has the advantage, like light or infrared, um, that if you have the real signal, that means the wave shape, as shown in the video, as somebody who are familiar with that, that there was a fast rise time and then a low part, longer part, and this signal carries a lot of information. And this is typical for electromagnetic waves. Unfortunately, like every detector, we have between the source and the detector, we have something in between. And this makes distortion, transmission, the frequency will change, damping and so on. So you cannot definitely say this part is best. This depends definitely on the equipment, GS, transformer, air insulated, whatever. So you have to use a mix of them. That's my feeling and my experience. All right, thank you very much. We continue to talk about partial discharge. The next question is uh, from Turkey. Thank you very much for the question. And it goes to Kave. Um, what are the factors that cause obstacles in the process of detecting partial discharges? How to set up a partial mm -hmm. discharge measurement best? What is your opinion about this? Uh, yeah. So strictly saying, we are not going to measure partial discharge because partial discharge happens inside the insulators or where we have no direct access to. What we are measuring, we measure some indications of the partial discharge. This could be, for example, some current pulses, some electromagnetic waves, some sound signals, or some light emissions. So that means if it's possible to see some of these indications, this would be a good idea, and we have um, very, very easy, we can very, very easily measure or detect a partial discharge. The problems arise when we have some uh, noises or some environments where these indications are overlapped. So, for example, if you have very high noise levels, so and then you are not able to distinguish the current pulses related to the partial discharges. So you cannot measure the partial discharge in that way. So, or if the voltage source you are going to use has some characteristics like the partial discharge signals. For example, if you have very high uh, frequencies in the noise signal, uh, in, in the voltage signal, for example, if you have very high or very short rise times in the pulse voltage system. So it's very um, difficult to distinguish between the voltage and the partial discharges or the currents coming from the voltage source and the partial discharges. And then you can use other methods. For example, we have 
successfully used in one of the applications this light emissions to detect some of the partial discharges in uh, one of the test objects related to this solid state or power semiconductor switches, so for high voltage applications, but under the pulse conditions. And this is one of the ways to do that. So, I mean, the, uh, the main question would be if it's possible to see one of the indications. If not, we have to decide for another type of indication, for example, the electromagnetic wave, as mentioned by the colleagues. So, uh, this ultra high frequency detection or light emission or acoustic emission. Thank you, Kavin. Yes, yeah, the obstacle, obstacles in the process of detecting partial discharge. Um, Kairit Meyer, how to set up here the measurement best? Yeah, this is something like a try and error. You, you try with some standard settings uh, where you're familiar with, which are recommended in some standards, for example, the IEC standard 60 to 70 um, suggests the frequency range in the 10 kilohertz up to a megahertz. And uh, then you can uh, change uh, the, the filters, the measurement filters, like you change the radio stations and uh, you can check um, whether or whether you're not in a, in a good environment, a good uh, noise condition to, to distinguish between partial discharges and ambient noise. Um, of course, also the connection, if you do on-site te testing, how is everything connected to the grounding system? Um, are there other disturbances very close? Uh, power electronic drivers uh, for for uh, some pumps or, or electrical machines, which maybe can be switched off during the measurement. Um, but nevertheless, it's something that you have to try on site. And um, it's always good to compare the signal to noise ratio. If you have something like a pulse calibrator, a charge calibrator, you may be able to find some good areas in the frequency range where you can do a successful sensitive PT measurement. All right, thank you very much. And of course, we have to talk also about the cost. So, um, Ralf, the lowest cost technology, but effective to identify PD or GIS acoustic, ultra high frequency, TEV, what do you think? Um, during my time before high void, I have done some commissioning tests on GIS and we used everything. That means ultra high frequency acoustics and of course not light emission. In some cases, yes. And let's say in that way to pinpoint the partial discharge in a transformer, but in a GIS it's much better than the acoustic is very precise and cheap. But of course you have to call along the whole GIS. This takes some time. I've done it for two days on the substations. And then you can pinpoint up to 20 centimeter, but it takes a lot of time. But if you combine it with a UHF technology plus acoustics, and the UHF has a disadvantage as mentioned by uh, Kai Redmeyer, that um, the damping behavior is by the way an advantage because if you have many sensors, then you can locate it. And if you like to pinpoint it in the range of 20 centimeter, then you go with the acoustic probe and then you can say, okay, it's exactly here at this spacer or at this uh, disconnector. So it depends on the equipment you have in front of you. A follow-up question to this, um, Ralf. Considering the harmful PD occurs or the GIS occurs after 10 or 20 years, when and how often should we check the PD? Oops, um, let's say that way, if there's no moving part, then we have a core of aging, but in a gas insulated substation you don't have. In a liquid, maybe if it's not circulating, then you have to, can have a very long time interval. It's more critical if you have vibrations like within a circuit breaker or something like that. You have abbreviation of small tiny particles or something can move inside uh, GS or even inside a transformer. That is more tricky and then you can do it. In Seagull, for example, there were two papers published about how useful is monitoring of GIS. In the Seagull, there's a pro, pro and cons equally. Uh, so there's no saying, okay, making PD monitoring with UHF and then you get everything and the otherwise versa. 
there's a, again a technical compromise and you cannot detect everything even if you have the most sensitive technical device it's some of the flash overs came out of the blue so again um, the most expensive equipment is a transformer and that's worthwhile to spend much more money than for a GS for example yeah. or a cable but the cable is more tricky Okay, and we're interested, of course, in the opinion also of Kai Redmayer to this question. So, Kai, the lowest cost technology, acoustic, ultra, high frequency, TEF? So, low cost does not only mean uh, how expensive is equipment you have to buy, but uh, low cost also means, means how many time do you need to uh, apply these sensors uh, on site how many days do you need to to prepare a test and therefore everything which is good uh, to use for an online measurement uh, would be my first approach for example TEV sensors which can be placed magnetically um, outside uh, of switch gears and transformers acoustical mm -hmm. sensors where you don't have to switch off your live transformers this is very good in my opinion because um, the customer still is uh, in service, uh, gets its voltage and uh, current and power and therefore you can start to detect uh, with low cost condition. Low cost means uh, no um, money for, for uh, shutting down the system. Um, nevertheless, everything else where you have to shut down the system is more sensitive. Uh, so then we come to the ISC measurement, which is, in my opinion, the only one which is compar comparable. If you want to compare inception vol vol uh, voltages or charge levels or whatever. Um, so um, it's not that easy to just distinguish between expensive equipment and non-expensive equipment. It's the whole package. Mm -hmm. And another question that we got in advance is coming from Iran. It goes to Yuri. The question is, does the PD value affect the lifetime of the cable and the breakdown voltage? Other, other question, um, does the contaminant in insulation, so in the meaning of cross-linked residuals, affect the PD value? Uh, well, uh, I think to answer this question, we need to really look a bit on the physics, what, the, what is happening when we have a, a partial discharge, which is uh, essentially kind of micro spark, which appears, uh, as was shown in the video, either in the void or it may be, for example, if you talk about motor insulations, it can be kind of twisted pair system. Where, where we may have uh, also these micro discharges. So what, what's happening? Uh, basically, we have uh, local breakdown in a way and uh, associated with a uh, number of processes. So it's byproducts in the plasma, which appears in the gas, which may react with, with, with a solid material. Uh, if it's about the cavity, for example, uh, in the solid. Uh, it's UV radiation, it's... Uh, um, also kind of charge injection uh, in the solid material on the interface. Uh, all these processes uh, in principle lead to the uh, degradation of the of the solid material starting from the interface uh, between the, the gas and, and, and solid. Uh, and in this sense, of course, the, the higher intensity of partial discharge uh, actually indicates the higher rate of degradation uh, of the material. And uh, in the long run, uh, this local breakdown may develop to the uh, to the complete breakdown of the system. And contaminants, okay, uh, depends what kind of contaminants we may have. So uh, if the, the byproducts which are produced uh, uh, in this uh, micro discharge. Uh, um, can trigger some additional reactions, for example, uh, on the solid wall of the void. Uh, so, uh, in that case, uh, we may expect some kind of enhanced degradation and uh, uh, accelerated aging of the material locally, which may lead to, to, to some uh, development of the tree or, or some other kind of unwanted phenomena. So that's how I see this situation. Okay. I'm giving this question also to uh, Kai. Does the PD value affect the lifetime of the cable and the breakdown voltage, Kai? Yes, of course. That's why we do partial discharge testing, because we expect that a high PD level and a high PD activity will 
do something with the insulation material. We'll change the insulation material. We get electrical treeing, um, so a tree grows inside the insulation and finally leads to a final breakdown. So yes, uh, to sum it up and to keep it short, um, the PD activity, the PD level um, will reduce the lifetime of the cable. And thank you very much. And Uwe, we still have some minutes for some more questions out of our chat. All right. So I have filtered the question in the chat uh, to uh, the label PD, partial discharge. And I would like to start with a question to Ralf, uh, because it's standard related. So why the IEC require a combination of withstand testing and partial discharge measurement in the factory for the routine test and why is it possible only to have a simple withstand test without PD after uh, the installation in the field? Um, to answer it may be easy uh, because uh, a standard needs time to be developed and at that time when the standards was written the sensitivity of the conventional method was not as sensitive as um, and that's the reason and if you use other technologies then like the GIS or the UHF method then it's normally done then all customers uh, ask for that and the standard does not i don't know why my explanation is that this is historical technical evolution of uh, standards yeah uh, putting that into uh, the question of cables, so then uh, you can also come up then with the question, so uh, why do we have there different, uh, for different kind of ta cable testing and also different kind of uh, duration, so for the on-site testing, uh, where also a PD measurement is recommended. I think this is also a work from uh, CKRE. So uh, why do we have to do the test for one hour? Um, it's as already explained by the other participants here, and PD starts on a microscopic scale. And even before you have partial discharge, you have fast electrons, which starts to deteriorate the material, breaking up chemical bonds and so on. And then if this is big enough, then the PD activity in a void really starts. And this takes time, and this is by chance. That means uh, if you just watch for one minute, uh, okay, the is perfect. There's an example. Okay, it's mixing up different um, measurements, but we can show here is the PD inception, the percentage, and the measuring time. And um, the defects, of course, are different, but this is a summary of re real life, or real measurements published by the SIGRA uh, the study committee B1. And you see here that uh, to cover the PD activity or the inception time, you need time. And this is especially for solid or liquid materials. For gas, it's different. And this needs time that you can detect it. And it needs also time that the PD starts. And this is beautifully shown here in this diagram. Yeah, so this is exactly showing why we went up to the one hour testing so that we have then uh, also covered all the potential failures there. More questions before the final statements of our experts? Yes, yeah, so then I have carefully to choose. So, I, yeah, there is one short question where I expect uh, maybe not so short answers. How to reduce noise in the test circuit? And we have related to that also a lot of other questions coming in. Okay, so if I do a calibration towards uh, my cable under test so and uh, tune my test system like that, then uh, I have a um, higher background, background noise uh, on the measurement. So therefore, reduction of noise in the test circuit, I think that's something with what is uh, a, re a request and a question all around the world. Who wants to take the noise reduction? Maybe Kai, uh, with uh, your experience, uh, you are the right one. To go to, to, so to go to in the first I, round. Yeah, maybe I start. Um, maybe I start. Um, so the, the grounding system, of course, is very important. Um, um, the the possibility of your measuring system to get rid of disturbances, for example, by using selective filter mechanisms, um, by using gating technology. So um, you have a lot of 
possibilities to reduce uh, the noise level, depending on, on what kind of noise uh, you really have. There is pulse-like noise types coming from power electronics, for example. There is uh, statistical noise, uh, like, like white noise. Um, and uh, for every kind of noise, there are some strategies to get rid of them. And finally, it's more or less uh, try and error once again, because these noise environments they depend on the location where you do the test. For example, in Asia, you will have different uh, radio transmitters frequency compared to Europe, uh, and therefore you uh, need different filter settings to get a clean partial discharge measurement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who else wants to take up the question on noise in PD measurement circuits? Maybe. Ralf. Uh, again, I've just opened a secret technical brochure. It's this 502, and this is made by the working group D133, published in 2012 about high voltage on site testing with PD measurement. And this gives some hints, as Kai mentioned. Uh, very important is the preparation on site before you start with the measuring, as already mentioned. And this technical brochure gives some of these hints. Okay, thank you. Uh, I already got the sign that uh, we have to come to an end. So uh, there is definitely a pity that we have not the chance to answer all the questions. So the questions are not lost. So we will uh, take care of the questions and uh, we will then also uh, most probably uh, develop a format also to make then the answers also available. And we have the nice tradition here at the High Vault Web Talk to have a final statement of our experts, not more than one minute. And uh, about the, today's Q&A, we talked about simulation, gas insulation, circuit breakers and partial discharges. We start with Kevin Yesh, your final statement of today's round. Uh, yeah, so probably a few sentences. So first of all, we see that the power systems are evolving. So that means the high voltage power equipment are exposed to new stresses, new requ requirements. And this makes the research in this area still very interesting and highly dynamic. Thank you very much, Professor Kaven Yesh in Norway, jumping to Sweden to Yuri Serjuk. Uh, yes, I, I fully agree with uh, with Kavik that okay, uh, practical needs really drive uh, today uh, development of technologies and then uh, give us the possibility to do research uh, in, in new fields. Uh, I would like also uh, thanks for for the inviting for this session, for the invitation. Uh, I personally learn a lot today, uh, so thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Juri uh, Sedjuk in Sweden. And we jump a little bit more south to Kiel to Professor Kai Rittmeier. Now that's not that much south. No, it's uh, <laughs> I can really see south you. South Sweden, over there, south guys. North um, Kiel. So, my, my final statement. Um, as you mentioned in the very beginning, uh, only no PD is good PD. Um, what I mean with this. Uh, with the sentence is that um, some standards don't define uh, limit values as, as very often somebody tells you, oh, you have to reach a limit of five picocoulombs for solid insulation because this is written somehow in the standard. Um, sometimes um, this is a requirement for the ambient noise level, not a limit value uh, which you have to pass or as a fail criterion. Um, in some standards uh, for cable, for example, um, there is really the limitation that you must not find any partial discharges above your sensitivity. And this is the only result where you don't have discussions at the end with the customer. Thank you. And our journey ends coming from Norway to uh, South Sweden, North Kiel, and now definitely in the South to Ralf Peach. Actually, where are you located right now, Ralf? Uh, it's northeast of Dresden. <laughs> northeast of Dresden. Great. Your final statement. Yeah, it's about 40 kilometers. Uh, final statement, uh, maybe just to add something. Um, 
the world is the high voltage world is still interesting, especially because the DC world starts since about 10 years, and we have new materials, new combinations of materials, and coming back to the word PD, partial discharge under DC is really a different thing, and this is also handled by Segre, and uh, maybe next year there will also be published a um, Segre brochure about partial discharge under DC, not covering everything, but stressing that this is a real challenge to keep this diagnostic tool under the DC world operating. That's my final stage statement. Thank you Thank very you. much to our expert. Thanks for this extra long session, 90 minutes Q&A, the end of the fall season. And thank you to Dr. Uwe Kaltenborn for all the preparation. It was a pleasure. And yeah. I learned a lot. Me too. So that's exactly also the reason why we're doing that here. And uh, I think uh, what we have seen today is uh, that uh, direct current solutions, HVDC solutions, that uh, will be the topic for the future. Power electronics will be a topic for the future. Alternative gases will be a topic for the future. And uh, yeah, that's also then uh, a long list uh, of uh, topics to be continued also uh, in a format like the web talk uh, we have done so far. For this year, it was the last one. Mm -hmm. Florian, thank you very much for uh, moderating all the the uh, web talks here. A lot of thanks also to all the people you cannot see because yes. they are behind behind uh, Our, the scenes you. here, which have uh, done uh, an extreme effort uh, to make it possible that we have the chance to uh, do this uh, this broadcasting, this live broadcasting as we have done, and also not only behind the scenes, and uh, also behind behind the scenes, uh, <laughs> the colleagues, because uh, normally this, uh, all the places we are, we are broadcasting from are standard uh, factory uh, mm -hmm. areas, and uh, therefore the colleagues have then also changed shifts and moving equipment around so that we have then sufficient space here. And also a lot of thanks to the colleagues there, which have uh, to we move the way that we have the chance to do the web talk live here from Dresden. And of course, you can share the web talk, go on the highvault.com site, then on web talk. And then, of course, you can share the talks, uh, also previous talks, um, and uh, people would get answers there to their questions. Uwe, I think this was the final word. Thank you very much. Thank you. We say thank you and goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen aus Dresden.